so much covering. Hashem to Hashem. Hashem should bring covering to you, to all of Israel, and also to your family. Oh, Vechei, take over the Hashem, and I'm going to you, the other one is why. Take over the Hashem, and I'm going to you, the Sing with me, Simcha, Leartzecha, Welcome to the Yeshiva Shalmaila, this is David Lichtenstein, and since it's before Yom Kippur, we will be doing a program on forgiveness. The Yud Gimel Midas HaRachmim, the Rabbi Nishalom says after them, Salachti Kidvarecha. What are, what's the secret? What, how do they cause forgiveness? How do they bring to forgiveness? We will have a number of wonderful guests. Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Jacobson, Dr. David Pelkowitz, the famous psychologist, Binyamin, Rabbi Binyamin Prusanskri, the Oscarl author, Rabbi Benzian Klatskow. This should be a really wonderful program. Before we begin, I want to say a short thought on the Yamim Narayim. The tour brings from the Sfaradish Arishan, the Abu Draham. He says, on, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we say a tefillah, we say uvechein. Uvechein ten kavod, uvechein ten pachtecha, uvechein tzadikim, if you're out of Sfarad, you say uvechein yiskadosh, that we don't find any place else in tefillah. So the Abu Draham says, where does this come from? He says it comes from Esther, that by Esther she said, Uvechein Avayel HaMelech, and we say it therefore on Rosh Hashanah. Now, that's very nice, but we know that Esther said it, but what is Esther doing in the middle of the Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur davening? So let me give you some insight into Pshad and the Abodraham, what I believe is Pshad and the Abodraham. Do you know, in Persia, where Esther was, there's a word that you find maybe 20 times in the Megillah that you don't find practically any place else in the whole Tanakh. And what is that? Kados. As was the custom, the culture, the law. Vashtia kados einoines. Kedas malases b'malka vashti. Kol yoide das v'din. Ve'ikase b'dase parasamade, etc. And what does kados mean? It was the culture, the etiquette, the rule. It was a, very, a, a society with lots of rules and customs. So when Mordechai tells Esther, go to the Melech HaChashverosh, uninvited, what does she say? Whoever would come, La Melech HaShaloi Kedas, would get killed. This is a society that has lots and lots of laws and rules. So Mordechai tells her, but you have to go. Im HaCharish Tacharishi, so what does she say? She says, I will come. Even though uninvited, against the rules, against the custom, against the culture, I will come in front of the king. Why do we say this Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? Because the question is, we come in front of you and I, we go in front of the Melech Malchem Amlachem, and we have all kinds of requests. We want a life of Chaim Toivim, Nichtar B'Sef Rechaim, Parnasava V'Chalkala, Zchuyais, we ask for V'Chein Yiskadish, and the question is, excuse me, who are you? Abdovidol V'Abistashayin. Mr. Lichtenstein, who are you coming in front of Melch, Melech Malchem Amlachem? Who, who are you? A better Mr. Givarin. 
What are you? What, I know the Rebbeinu Shalom knows what we did this year. He knows the the the, the places we've been, the various we may have been, the the chatoim, the pshayim, the avoynes. Who are you to be a better? So what does Klal Yisrael say? We say, wait, wait, wait. Our our Queen Esther, Unzer Baba, she was my senefe. She came in front of the Melech Hashverish, Ashalaikid us, unworthy, uninvited, against the rules. But that's what she. That's what. That's what he didn't do. The same shineis me kalam. Without when when we dress the way we do, when we that hug is that we have. They're all shalikad us. Isn't Klal Yisrael? Weren't we for thousands of years the conscience of the world? Isn't when a hedonistic society, when somebody says, "I won't eat this and I won't do this and I don't behave this way." And we have this restraint and the other restraint. Where they say I'm shaynais. So she said, I will come shalaykadas. So you know what Esther did? She empowered Klal Yisrael forever to be lovey lefnei ha-melech shalaykadas. So when we come in front of a different melech, the melech malchei ha-melechem, we say, uvechein we say the v'chein, we bring Esther, uvechein avay el ha-melech ha-shalaykadas. You and I can come in front of the Melech Malchei Hamlachem Kadosh Baruch Hu. Asher like it us. We use the card that Esther, the voice that Esther gave all of us. So when we start our tefillas, our Shman Esrei, we right away bring Esther. I am here, uninvited, unworthy. Ka'ani ba Pesach, because of Achein Avi Ela Melech Asher like it us, and therefore I could say. So let's finish all quality of Israel. What Tzvila should be in Iskabal. This week's program is about forgiveness, about the Yud Gimel Midas Arachmim. And you know, most of us say the Yud Gimel Midas Arachmim well over a hundred times between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, Slichas, etc. And we don't necessarily know what we're saying. Do you know that the Gemara says, that Kol's man, the Gemara Rosh Hashanah, Abba Rosh Hashanah, Kol's man she Yisrael choytim, Yasu lefanei kisei drezeh. So we think it means just to say, but it says Yasu. And Kadmainim, many Kadmainim, the Shalah, etc., but as late as the Chafetz Chaim, the Chafetz Chaim gives a mushal. He says, imagine somebody hires an employee, and he gives him a set of instructions, and he comes back 30 days later, and he says, no, no, how's it going? And the fellow says, it's wonderful. Every day I read the instructions, this lahavas. He says, the employee would start screaming. He would say, shaita, idiot, dimwit. I didn't give you the instructions to read the instructions. I gave you the instructions to follow the instructions. So the Hafez Chaim writes, he says, what is the Yud Gimel Midas Arachmim? We're supposed to emulate. Mahu Chanun Afata Chanun. Mahu Rachum Afata Rachum. He says, Yasu Imei Kesei Dazer. We're supposed to emulate them, to, 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 to activate these 13 steps of Mechila, Salachti Kedvarech, to bring to that. We're supposed to f- learn to forgive in that matter. So he says, just reading them is not the point. So if the, what all these Kadmonim say is correct, but and all the way to the Chavetz Chaim say is right, so the question is, Chanun maybe we understand, Rachum we understand. When you say Hashem Hashem, what does that mean? How do you emulate them? Neither you or I are God, no matter what our mothers thought of us. So how do we emulate the Hashem Hashem? What does it mean? And you know, I remember a footnote said years ago. He said, I remember him saying, he's saying there was a Malamed in Lublin who touched Hoid Hadar Kavodai, the beauty of the beauty of his beauty, the Shankai from the Shankai from the Shankai. We say all these things. What does that mean? How is Hashem Hashem? How is each one different of the Yigilu Midas Arachbim? And how do we use these tools to forgive others? How, do we, how does it come to Salachti Kidvarecha? That's our goal of tonight's program. So let me start. And for each of them, or for many, we will have one of these great Rabbanim, Magidim, say a story and a mashal to explain it. So what's the, the first of the Yud Gimel Midas Arachman? Hashem. Hashem, Hashem, kill Racham Lechanan. So the Rosh asks, so the Gemara says, one Hashem is before sin, before hate, and the second Hashem is after hate, Hashem, Hashem, to which the Rosh asks, 
What do we need Hashem before? Why do we need forgiveness, Rachamim, before Chait? And the Mepharshim say something powerful. You know what you need Rachamim before Chait? Because if we have unreasonable expectations of others, if we don't anticipate Chait, if there's Hashem before Chait, that means it's forgiveness anticipating that Chait is coming. What does that mean? That means the worst thing we could have in a relationship is unrealistic expectations. Perfect. You know the person, they get married, they think their spouse is always going to look like they did when they're dating. That their behavior is always going to be as polite when they're dating. They're always going to open the door. They're always going to say the right thing. Always have a smile on their face. And we know how. We know how unrealistic that is. Do you know the most popular article written last year in the United States was an article called, it was actually a book, You Will Marry, Why You Will Marry the Wrong Person. And this sociologist says that just about everybody marries the wrong person. It's a very depressing article for many people. It says we marry for the wrong reasons, etc. But the counter to that article people wrote was, Takar, no, it's true there is no miss the right and there is no Mrs. Right. There is no perfect mate. But on the contrary, our job is to turn the person we married into the right person. There is no perfect spouse. And if there was perfect, it probably wouldn't be for you. And we shouldn't be marrying the right per- the, the Mr. or Mrs. Perfect. What we need are not pa- partners who never disagree with us, we need partners who are good at disagreeing. So what's the, the greatest hindrance to a good relationship? The ex- expectation of perfection. It's the enemy of relationship. This Instagram photoshopped relationship that doesn't really exist. When I was a, a child, my mother sent me to Magan Avram Kemp in the mountains with $10 for the canteen, for snacks. And I was in Bunk Aleph, I was six years old, and I guess the snacks looked good, and I was hungry, as sometimes a six- or seven-year-old is. And the third week, I spent all my $10 already. So once a month, once a week on Sundays, we would call Collect Home for five minutes. I remember waiting, and I called up. And when I called home, I must have sounded very sad, so my mother said, what's the matter? I said, I ran out of money, and there's still another week of camp, and I'm hungry. I want some nash. So my mother said, did you, know, did you notice in your duffel bag there's like a zipper compartment? I said, yes. She said, I said, I didn't put anything in it. So my mother said, look in there, and you'll find an envelope with an extra $5. And I said to my mom, but how did you know that I would run out of money? And my mom said, that's what mothers do. I anticipated that you would spend maybe a little more than you were supposed to. And I went, and it was there. So what does the first Hashem Kaidem Achet mean? Yes, your wife will not be perfect, nor will your husband. Your child will disappoint you. Your parents will inevitably disappoint you. Everybody you know will not meet up to some standard of perfection. But what is a a smart person know that people are imperfect, they're vulnerable, they're frail, they have emotions, they have good days, and they have bad days. And when we can anticipate and forgive in advance, when it happens, there's no crushing disappointment. It was built in, there's a margin of error. You're, we allow X number of failures a month or a day, or sometimes an hour. And when we do that, it turns the relationship never has its crushing moments because we forgave in beforehand, and that's the first me the forgiveness before. You know, Rabbi Stroll used to say, not only do people have unrealistic expectations about one person, sometimes they have they roll many expectations of perfection into one. He says he met somebody who used to be all upset that he didn't have the the. Uh, Harifus of the Shagasarye, 
the heart of the Yisayid Vishayi Rishavayda at the Midas of the Mizil Susharim, Rabbi Stroll used to laugh. He would say, this person picked three paragons in three totally different fields, three of the great, and he expected them all to be of himself. So what do we do? Not only do we set expectations to be better than one person, we sometimes set expect such foolish expectations. We combine the milus of many people. So not only is the first Hashem to forgive others by having realistic expectations, but maybe, most importantly, to have realistic expectations about ourselves. Here's a story from Dr. David Pelkowitz, the renowned psychologist. He demonstrates this meter. We're talking about the realistic expectations as being the key for a healthy relationship, including the need to not expect perfection from one's family member or close friend or one's spouse. And here, my favorite story is the, the story of a young boy, a 15-year-old boy, who had issues. And one day, as soon as Shabbos was over, he um, runs out of shul, goes to, into the main street of town, goes down a stairwell in the street where he had for before Shabbos a marijuana cigarette waiting, waiting for him. He lit it up and he starts to smoke. People do drugs generally either to feel good or to feel better. He was doing drugs to feel better. He was self-medicating a depression, which I'll explain in a minute. But as he was lighting up, the Rosh Yeshiva of the Masifta that he was going to walks by. He had kept 72 minutes. And he smells the unmistakable smell of marijuana, looks down the stairwell, sees one of his Talmidim, and immediately throws him out of the Yeshiva. I got a call from the parents of this boy begging me to intervene. They said, look, the, nobody in town knows what happened. It's not going to impact on the reputation of the yeshiva, yeshivas or anything you could do. So I called the Rosh Yeshiva. I told him that, look, this is not going to impact at all. I said, I'm happy. I'll start working with the boy. I told him that I'll fax him um, a, um, a, a, a monthly report showing that he's clean in terms of uh, doing no drugs. And I would uh, be in regular touch with him with this boy's and his parents' permission on the progress of therapy. He very reluctantly agreed to take the boy back into yeshiva. He said, you miss even one report showing that the boy is clean or one therapy report, he's out of the yeshiva. So I saw him. I was seeing him for a number of months, and it became very clear that this is a boy who came from a family where he had Older brothers, each one more brilliant Talmud Chacham than the next, each one a superstar in learning, each one remarkable in terms of fulfilling the bumper sticker of the family, which was to learn Torah nonstop or else in the top, top yeshivas. And this boy couldn't do it. It's not that he wouldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He had, as I discovered, a pretty bad attention deficit disorder. He had a reading disability. And even though we were addressing that, he told me that every day he'd go home and he'd be exposed to the looks of disappointment in his parents' eyes, where all they saw when they looked at him was a boy who was not realizing their dreams of what they considered to be the need for, for true acceptance in this family, the perfection of meeting the expectations of being a top Talmud Chacham. I was getting nowhere with him. But after a number of months, I asked him, who in the extended family gets you? Who understands you? Who really is somebody who you think gets to your core? And he said, my grandfather, my father's father. So I arranged a session with the boy, his parents, and the grandfather. This grandfather was supporting the whole family. He's a very wealthy man. He was paying for all the older brothers um, to go to uh, yeshiva and to uh, be able to live a very wonderful, um, affluent kind of lifestyle. He didn't know about the incident with the Rosh Yeshiva catching his grandson smoking marijuana. So I started the session by telling 
telling him the story of the Rosh Yeshiva who walking by saw his grandson smoking on Motzei Shabbos, immediately the grandfather got furious. He stood up, he looked at his children, and he said, you never told him, you never told your son the whole reason why this family exists. When I was his age, when I was exactly his age, we were living in Europe. And I was street smart, just like he, he is. I also didn't have the zitzlash to sit down and to learn. But I saw what was coming, and I begged my parents to, to move. I begged them to flee the Nazis. And they didn't listen. And then he starts to cry. And he turns to his grandson. He turns to his children. He says, and you know what happened. You know what happened. They were all lost, my parents, my siblings my nephews, my nieces, the only one who survived was me because I saw what was coming and I was able to escape. And then he heads towards the door of my office and with tears in his eyes, he looks at his son and daughter-in-law and he said, if you can't make room for this kind of neshama, I don't want to have anything to do with any of you. He was telling to his children. He says, this is the reason why our family is here. And he slams the door of my office, drives away. I never saw him again. But what was left in my office was three crying people, the boy and his parents. You could almost see them expand their neshama to allow for the bumper sticker of this boy, to allow to the uniqueness of his neshama to come in. And it's this aspect of the hey before faith, of not expecting perfection, of not letting any family member live with that look of disappointment in their eyes to make space for their uniqueness because everybody has that uniqueness. The end of the story is that this boy ended up eventually taking over the grandfather's business, made it even more successful than it was before. And today, all of those older brothers, having left yeshiva, are working for him. What's the second Hashem? Is Rachmim, is forgiveness, Yeftichet. What does that mean? Yes, somebody has deeply hurt you. A spouse, somebody you love, a partner at work, a chavrusa. A friend, what is the Hashem Yeftechet? Hashem Yeftechet, and Abisha Chaim, he says, is Ani Hashem Loishanisi. What does he explain? He says, just because you were hurt, or just because that person, rather, he says, just because that person hurt you, doesn't mean the person is all bad. There could be still something about them that you genuinely admire. Yes, the person was a jerk and a, a icewarf and a, and a ingrate, but what did you like about them originally? They had a good sense of humor. Well, do they still have a good sense of humor? Did they lose that too because they disappointed you? Or maybe there was something else. Maybe it was the smile. Maybe you found their personality wonderful. Whatever it may be. So the Nef Shaheim says, Look at the good in that person, or like, or like the Holy Lezhensky says, look at the part of that person that you can still admire, the part of them that's still wonderful, and over there we can maybe rebuild our relationship from. Do you know that I have a friend that in the simonim of Rosh Hashanah, he has that prickly Israeli cactus. Is it called an Ego Z? I'm not sure. And what is it? It's a, it's a cactus. It's very prickly, but when you cut it open, it's very sweet inside. And he says, you know what? I use that to simon. I use that for shenira kol echad mailas chavireinu v'leches reinim. He may say he rutsin. Let me recognize that, yes, there are people that have very prickly parts to them that you can really cut yourself on. But on the other hand, there are parts of them that could be incredibly sweet. And that's the second mile of Hashem. Look for the good. And over there is where even after somebody has hurt you, we can use that as a foundation to rebuild the relationship. Here's a story from Rebentian Klatskow.
I want to share with you an extraordinary story that my father, Dr. Klatsko from Cleveland, witnessed years ago. There was a shul that had a president who was a very prestigious fellow in the community. And somehow the president had insulted one of the members of the shul. And this member was an older gentleman, and he was insulted. The president was not aware that he had insulted him. But from then on, this older gentleman, so upset, couldn't look at the president, stopped coming to shul that often. When the president was informed that this older gentleman had felt insulted, the president was beside himself. He couldn't, uh, he, he couldn't face Yom Kippur knowing that he had insulted somebody. So he went over to this elderly gentleman and said, Dear sir, I'm so sorry that I insulted you. That was never my intention. Please be Michael me. But rather than be Michael him, the elderly gentleman dug in and he said, No, I'm not going to be Michael you. I'm sorry, I can't be Michael. You insulted me, Barabim, and I'm not going to be Michael you. The president didn't know what to do. His davening was stared. He wasn't able to learn properly. He couldn't function to know that another yid wasn't Michael him. Now we know Hashem is a kelrachum b'chanun erach apayim rav chesed v'yemes. Hashem gives us so much rachmanus. He extends his mercy. He extends his forgiveness. And we, before Yom Kippur, we have to do the same. But for not, uh, it's not easy for everyone to extend that kind of mechila. And the president could not get that mechila. Didn't know what to do. The following Shabbos, it was Shabbos Shuvah, and the shul was packed with people. And this elderly gentleman had attended shul as well. And the president Seeing the elderly gentleman there, he made up his mind. He knew exactly what to do. Before leaning, he clapped on the bima. He stood up and he said, I'd like to publicly ask Mechila from this member of our shul. And he mentioned the member's name. He said, I did not mean to insult him, but I was at fault. He was insulted and it was my mistake. And since I did it, Barabim, I'd like to ask Mechila Barabim. And I hope you can forgive me. And everyone turned their heads to look at the older man to see, would he be Meichelim? But then rather than be Meichelim, this older man's face turned red and he got upset. And his hands began to flail and he, he screamed, you, why should I be Meichelim? I'm an older person. You can't do that to me. You think because you're the president, you have the right to insult people. And the shul froze. Everyone didn't know what's going to happen. How could this be? Someone asked Mechila Barabin, and the person says, no, how embarrassing, right before Yom Kippur. And the president stepped down from the bima. It was very upsetting to everyone. Even the rug of the shul looked visibly shaken. The president then proceeded to walk towards this older man and people thought to themselves, oh, no, there's going to be a showdown in shul. They're going to yell at each other right before Yom Kippur. And this elderly gentleman, he's still yelling. He's almost frothing in the mouth. He's so upset. How could you? How could you? Apparently, the hurt had lingered for a long time. It had festered inside of him, and he wasn't ready to let go, and he wasn't ready to forgive. Well. The president went over to this older man, and the older man was right in front of his face. What would the president do? Would the president kick him out of shul? After all, he was the president. He did ask Mechila Barabim, and he was rebuffed. He was rejected. But then the president did something extraordinary. He spread out his arms, and he gave this elderly gentleman a hug, and then he gave him a kiss. And then he whispered into his ear, please be Michael me. I feel so bad what I've done to you. And the older man, he calmed down. Color came back to his face. His arms hung down. They stopped flailing. And in a small way, he gave a hug back. He was Michael, and calm was restored to the shul. Someone said to the Rav, that's amazing what happened. What a... 
What a kiddush Hashem, but you can't kiss someone in shul. And the rabbi says, no, of course you can. But each yid is a Sefer Torah. And this Sefer Torah, there was, it, it was in pain. It was hurt. It, was, it, it, it had fallen to the floor. And because of that, you have to kiss it when you pick it up, of course. And each year we have to look at it as a Sefer Torah. We're all in ice in a Sefer Torah. And in the same way that Hashem is willing to be Michael us, but we just come over Bahachna and we say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I love you and I need your forgiveness. There's no way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu won't say, Machalach, Machalach, Machalach. Wish everyone a meaningful fast, a beautiful Yom Kippur, and a Gemach HaSimatoyza. The third Mida is the Mida of El. Shem Hashem, El Rachum V'chanan. And what does it mean? It's Milashin Havu Hashem B'nei Elim. It means strength. There's, we're looking in these midas, how do we emulate them? Well, if you understand that you're just to be ashamed of Hashem, well, we're not going to be God, right? So it's obviously something beyond that in the Mahani Afata. And what does El mean? El also means Kaharoisel, uh, like the mighty mountains, B'nai Elim, mighty people. What does might have to do with forgiveness? So in the Oivai Techachmeni, one of the Chachmi Umeisailam said, only the strong can forgive. If you have a lousy self-image, if your whole sense of self is just a reflection of what the other thinks of you, you look in their eyes, you see they, you, they're reflecting back at you, they think highly of you, then you think highly of yourself. Negative, you think negative of yourself. So then hurtful words could be devastating. It means, in effect, I don't exist anymore. But if I have a, a robust self-image, and my attitude is, of course we think differently. You have a right to the way you think. I have an obligation to be different than you. I was born looking differently, which was my day as have to be. In fact, there's a, a, a dictum of one of the Moisalem Chachem. Once Chachem once said, he said, if we're both, if two people are thinking the same thing, one of them isn't thinking. So what does that mean? If you agree with me, that means you're not thinking. And that's why, by the way, on the air, I always, when I have callers who strongly disagree with me, I say, Ah, the rabbi, your responsibility is to disagree with me. If you, st- if you just were, if it's just crowd think, then it's not the, it's the same Shavais. It's, it's not the way you were created. Every one of us. So if we accept, look, you have a right to yours. I have a right to mine. I respect your right to yours. But if you disagree with me, that doesn't change my mind at all. Then how could you hurt me? How could your negative words, hey, you spoke terribly. According to your understanding, I spoke terribly. According to my understanding, I thought I spoke very, actually very, very well with a lot of insights. You know, there's a story. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank was the Rav of Yerushalayim, and he was paid by the government. He was mitam harabonis, just like Rebel Yashiv was most of his life. He was on the Bezdin of the Rabbanus of Yerushalayim. So, but he had met, he had, Rav C. Pesach Frank had Kanoim who disagreed with him. They, at one point, they, the Badaf almost wanted to put him in Cherim. So uh, he, he was invited to a Bar Mitzvah, and the father of the Bar Mitzvah boy was a Mechutzif. And he, he called himself, quote unquote, a Kanoi. I don't think being Mavaza and Adam Gadol is a Kanoi, but today there's a miscast understanding of what a Kanoi is. A Kanoi is somebody who insults people. So uh, he had the Bar Mitzvah boy say an entire drusha to slug up, to re- re- repudiate a shtickel, uh, a piece of Torah that he wrote in the Hartzvi, or is it uh, Mikrei Kodesh, one of the two. So he sat there for a half an hour, and the Bar Mitzvah boy gave this fiery drusha, something in the Mikrei Kodesh is totally wrong, etc. He so there and chuckled. So after he finished, somebody came over to him and he said, you know, uh, Rav, are you going to change the piece? Are you going to take it out? Are you going to fix it? He said, no. He said, why, why should I fix it? He said, the Tysus, he said, he learned wrong shot in the Tysus. You look in the Marshal, the Marshal explained the Tysus doesn't mean this. And the Rambam, he said, he missed, he missed, he missed the Mishnah Lamelech. And, you know, everything. So he said, so why, why didn't the Rav say anything? So Sri Pesach looked at him quizzically. He said, why would I say something? 
not my bar mitzvah. His confidence was such that anything the person said, and in front of a hundred people, it just rolled right off of him. He knew who he was. Or well, like the famous Reb Tzaddik writes, in the Tzidka Tzaddik, he says, Kishem Sha'adam Tzorech Lahamin Ba'Kadosh Baruch Hu, just that there's a, moon, a, a mitzvah to be maimin in the Rabbani Shlalem, right? We have the, uh, the, the, the Yud Gimel Ani Mamins. Kach Tzorech Lahamin Ba'Atzmai. So, the same way, a person has to believe in himself. That I have a singular and a unique personality and a mission. And the fact that you don't agree because you have yours and I have mine. So how could I be insulted with you? Of course we think differently. How could we possibly think alike? So what's the third me, the ill? And what does this mean? Think back at something hurtful that somebody said to you. Something, and think to yourself, you know, is it really so hurtful? Or I understand people do things to disappoint. That's the first Mida. The second Mida, they said something hurtful, but there's still something about them that I like. And the third thing is, can they really hurt me? Yes, they said I said was stupid. They think it's stupid. I think it's very bright. They think my outfit was the wrong color. <laughs> Good for them. I think it's the right color. I don't like the way they decorate either. Do you know that? In our house, we make a shachiyanu, the second night of, of Rosh Hashanah. And we also do some of the simanim. It's two days in the Paiskim, whether you do simanim. So my wife brought out figs. And I made the shachiyanu, and I said, by the way, I, have, I want to say he rotsin for the fig too. What's the he rotsin for the fig? He rotsin mofanecha, that I should recognize that each one of us is different. geben de ganze Welt a feig. Right? What does that mean? To understand, look, give the world a fig is a way of saying, look, you have your opinion, you have a right to it, but have the inner strength to give the world a fig. That's the third Mida. And if you can do that, it's not such a hurtful place anymore. Here's another story from Dr. Pelkowitz that demonstrates this Mida. I wanted to talk about this concept of it's the strongest people with the most confidence and the best self-image, who have broad enough shoulders to be able to connect to this Mida of forgiveness. Here's the story illustrating this, the story about Rav Willig. Charlie Willig, who has a shul and is, um, you know, Rosh Yeshiva in, um, in, um, in Reitz, at Yeshiva University, he... Um, He's a person who I think epitomizes this kind of confidence mixed with anivas. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. And the story of, that illustrates this concept is Rav Willig shares the beautiful thought from Chafetz Chaim that every year, this time of year, it's decided how much suffering we're going to have, what kind of stress and losses and isyonos will we have in our life in the coming year. He says, for some people, it might come from losses of family members. For some people, it might come from loss of parnasa. For some people, it might come with shalom bias problems, or it might come with a variety of emotional illnesses. There's so many ways that we could have tough times in the coming year. But then the Chafetz Chaim says, if we're really lucky in the spirit of it being better from being from the now love in vain and those who are insulted who don't insult, he says if we're really lucky, some of our Yisurim in a given year will come in the form of people insulting us. He says if that happens, he says we should be mekabalit b'chalilim, like with the chalil. We should, it's like a simcha, it's like a bar mitzvah. We should dance with joy. One day, Rav Willig, when his children were much younger, was about to sit down to have dinner with his wife and his young children, and the phone rings. And it's one of the balabatim in his shul. And the man starts screaming nonstop at Rav Willig, cursing, cursing him horribly just going on and on, screaming so loud that the 
His wife and children were able to hear it, and they were concerned. Rabbi Willig, you know, just sort of said, whoa, whoa, tell me, I have no idea what you're angry about. Just explain to me. I want to hear what it is you're upset about. When Willig said that, the man got even angrier. He curses even louder. He says, you know what it is, and he's just going crazy at him. Willig, as he tells the story, what rushes through his mind is that beautiful Chafetz Chaim. And he thinks, you know something? Let me be makabel this b'chalilim. Let me dance to this. And he holds the phone over his head and he starts dancing b'simcha around the kitchen of his house. He said that his wife wanted to call the men in the white coats to take him away. But that was it. He hung up the phone and uh, he, uh, he just figured that, uh, you know, sometimes people get angry. What are you going to do? You know? He had broad enough shoulders to be able to uh, to allow somebody to be angry at him and to live with it, like the Rav Nachman said. That Erev Yom Kippur, he gets a phone call from the Spala bus, crying hysterically, saying, Rav Willig, I don't know if you could ever be mochel me. He said, a different Rav in town did something terrible to me. Somebody told me that it was you. It wasn't you. It was somebody else. And I've been so embarrassed about what I did to you that I wanted to wait till Erev Yom Kippur to call and ask you for Mechil. And of course, Rav Willig was Mochel him. But that illustrates this concept of the aspect of Mechil that comes from a robust sense of self and broad enough shoulders that allow a person to have somebody disagree with him or even be angry with, 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 with him or her without being reactive to it in a way that makes it even worse. The next Mida is Rachum. What does Rachum mean? The Vahaftalarecha Kamoicha, the Targum Taiches, Brichamtalarayusach. Love your neighbor, a Rechima, Bedechila Urechima, with Yira and Ahavara. Rachum means mercy, but it also means love. And it's a hint. Forgive because you need to be loved. Do you know that Maslow was a famous psychologist and he made the hierarchy of human needs? He said the base human needs is existential. He says a person needs water, they need food, they need shelter, they need clothing. Achilashtia, Lena, right? Eshel. You can't, you don't have clothing, you don't have food, you don't have what you die. He says after your physical necessities, you know what's the next thing? Next, next? Love. So without love, a person withers and dies. What's the proof? A prisoner, life in jail, they've taken everything away, his freedom, his possessions. There's one thing they, still that they can do to him. What is that? If he misbehaves, solitary confinement. The need for friendship, for companionship, if the food and shelter is the next thing in the, in the hierarchy. You know, they say that children in orphanages who aren't given love by, by, a, by a parent, somebody holding them till six or eight months are irrevocably damaged for life. Right? Well, like the story with Chayni Hamagil, Moran Tainus, he came back after, after that, and he, he didn't find, his friends were all gone, and he, he was mispal that he should die, or I forgot if Chazal, Bikshual of Rachman, if he was mispal, he said, Rusa, So we need love. So what's the reason to forgive? Yes, you really babbled me, you shake it, you shake the you ganif, you Russia. But if I stand on mine, and I end up without you, my friend, every friend hurts us at some point, every friend says the wrong thing, doesn't return the right call, every spare, I will be right, but I'll die. So the need for companionship says, you know, be makalkal as Ashura, look past it, okay, they babbled you. Let's go have a good time together. Let's schmooze together. Let's have a Sudas Rayim together. So the third reason is because I have to forgive because I need love in my life. And that's the Mida of Racham. Here is a story from Rabbi Yamin Przansky. I want to share with you a story that took place a few years ago in Lakewood, New Jersey. I have a good friend. His name is Reb Duvi Ben Shushan. Reb Duvi is a renowned speaker and he's a mashpia, and one day he gets a phone call, he was living in Lakewood at the time, he gets a phone call, 
And on the phone is a Rosh Hashiva. And the Rosh Hashiva says, Reb Duvi, I want to know, I heard that you are involved with teens, and you're very good with them. Can you talk to a boy that I know? He said, Rosh Hashiva, I'd love to, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very busy. I, I can't get involved right now. Reb Duvi, please, you don't understand this boy. He hasn't been home in two years. He's Mechal Shabbos. He needs chizik. He needs someone to take him in and talk to him, talk his language. Please, can you do it? He said, Rosh Hashiva, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I'd love to, but I really can't take on anything right now. Reb Duvi, please, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you. I'm begging you, please, have a heart for this boy. You know, Rosh Hashiva, he says, it sounds from your voice that you're talking about someone who's very close to you. Rosh Hashiva is silent for a moment, and he says, yes, this boy is very close to me. This boy is my son. My son and I don't see eye to eye. And unfortunately, he dropped out of yeshiva a few years ago. He hit the streets, and he's been living on the streets the last couple of years we still talk from time to time but I can't seem to make a kesha with him his Yiddishkeit has gone down he's resorted to taking drugs I need your help Reb Duvi. can you speak to my son and Reb Duvi said you know I, I said I didn't have time but when a father asks for someone to help his son how can I turn him, how can I turn him down of course I'll talk to your son if you can have him come to my house I'll spend some time with him. I'll see what I could do. And so sure enough, a little while later that day, it was Erev Shabbos. Dovi was in a rush to go to Brooklyn, where he's a rub, and he had to get going quickly. But there's a knock on the door. And in comes in this boy. He says, are you the rabbi I'm supposed to meet? He says, yes. How are you? He says, Baruch Hashem, good. Come, come inside. He comes inside, looking at this boy, he sees that, he sees in his eyes that he's a boy who went through a lot of pain, struggling. From his dress, it was obvious that he was no longer a religious boy. He said, let's talk a little. And they start to schmooze. And after a while of schmoozing, Dovi says, do you have any hobbies? He says, yeah. You know, I, I like to play the saxophone. He says, really? I love music. How about you go? And you bring your saxophone, bring it over here, and we'll play a little together. We'll play. I want to hear how you play. I'll listen to your music. He says, really? Sure. And he leaves. And Rav Duvi realized that one of, the, one of the most important things when it comes to Kirov is don't let him out of your sight because he might never come back. And so he let the boy go. He was wondering, will he actually come back? But sure enough, there was a knock on the door. This boy was back with his saxophone. He says, come, let's go to the basement, and we'll play some music together. I want to hear how you play. And they go to the, music, they go to the basement, and he says, okay. Do you, know, do you know any Mordechai Ben David songs? He says, no, I, I don't really know Jewish songs. I know how to play other songs. He says, okay, play a song for me. He starts playing a song, and Rabdubi starts to clap, and he starts to dance, and he starts to sing along with him. And the boy kept playing, and Reb Dovi kept clapping, showing him how much he enjoyed his music. And the boy was so excited, and he kept on playing and playing. And finally, he finished with a finale, and Reb Dovi clapped, and he gave the boy a big hug. He says, that was awesome. That was amazing. And the two of them went back upstairs, and he said goodbye to the boy. And the boy said goodbye to him, and he was on his way. Reb Dovi was there of Shabbos. He quickly got into his van, put his family inside, and he raced over to Brooklyn. An hour before Shabbos, Reb Dovi gets a phone call. It's the Rosh Hashiva. Reb Dovi, you know, you, you spoke to my son? He says, yeah. He says, Reb Dovi, what did you talk to him about? Did you talk to him about Torah? He said, no. Did you talk to him about Amuna? He said, no. Did you talk to him about keeping Shabbos? He said, no. So what did you talk to him about? You know, Shiva, all I did was play some music with him. I listened to how he played. That's all I did. The Rosh Shiva said, Reb Dovi, you don't understand what just happened. 
a few minutes ago, there was a knock on the door. I went to the door, opened it up, and there was my son. I haven't seen my son so long. And they're standing at the door and he says, Tati, it's been a long time. I want to come home. Tati, I want to come back home. We hugged. So, I don't know what you did. I don't know what you said. But you brought my son back home. You know, each of us, we all want to come back to the Rabbeinu Shalom. We're waiting. We want to come back to our father, come back home to him. Sometimes we don't know how. And sometimes it's nothing special that we have to say, nothing fancy. All we have to do is knock on the door and say, Tati, I want to come back home. I want to live a life of Ruchnius again. I want to live a life of Tyra again. I want to do a real tshuva. I want to become your beloved once again, Rabbi Nishalaylam. Tati, will you kick? Will you take me back, Ta? And our father, Aviyam Shabbat Shemayim, says, Son, I was waiting for you. I was waiting for you to come back and tell me those words. And now come here, let me give you a hug. When we go into Yom Kippur, let's remember that. Remember that our Father's waiting for us. We're going to dive in our hearts out. He's going to forget about everything that we've done before and see that we're at the door and give us, and give us that welcoming we've all been waiting for. The fifth meter is Chanun, and that Chanun is Miloshin Matnas Chinam. What does Achrayim say? Forgive. Not because the other person asked you. Not because he said, I'm sorry. But you know why to forgive? Because all that anger, it's hard to carry it around with you, isn't it? You wake up in the morning angry. The person who hurt you, it's not bothering him. But boy, is he eating out my neshama or your neshama, lugging it around like a bag of rocks every day? How do you run a race with a knapsack full of, full of rocks on your back. That person who may have hurt you, do you want to make him a free tenant in your head for the rest of your life or as long as you remember? Do you want somebody living for free in your brain? So why do we, why do we, we forgive for free? Not for your sake, but for my sake. Because I don't want to lug this heavy bag around with me anymore. So the next meter is Hanun. And you know that this is another thing we do Rosh Hashanah by night in my house. The Baal Shem Tev used to eat farfel Rosh Hashanah by night. And he used to pick up the farfel, a spoon of his wife's tasty farfel, and he would eat it and he would say, Farfalen is farfalen. Let bygones be bygones. Just let me start. Let, when I get up in the morning... Let the world look like a beautiful highway. And I, I'm in a race car with the keys and there are no police. It's just zoom. There's nothing holding me back. And the only way you can do that is with farfalen. So we eat farful Rosh Hashanah by night. Neged the Mida of Hanun. Move on for your own sake. Here's a story, powerful story, from Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Jacobson about how to move past and move on. Yochebed Brookstein remembers that summer's day very clearly. She was a young girl at the time, a camper in Camp Chedva in the Catskill Mountains in New York. It was visiting day, and her parents and grandparents came to visit her in camp. Her mother, her sister, her grandmother were in the bunk checking out what's going on in the bunk, and her father and grandfather were taking a stroll. They were walking around campgrounds, Enjoying the grounds, enjoying the weather, meeting friends, acquaintances, and so forth. Her grandfather is walking in the campgrounds. And another older man, presumably a grandfather of another camper, walks by her grandfather. Yocheved's father, Rabbi, notices 
how his own father locks eyes for a moment with the other older man, but just for a moment, he gives him a slight nod, a sign of acknowledgement, and he continues walking. Robbie, the son, is thinking to himself, who is this older man that my father just nodded to? Is he a cousin? Is he a neighbor? Is he an old business acquaintance? He never met him before, so he asks his dad, who is this guy? And the father pushes away the question. He's not really interested in answering, which, of course, made his son curious. And he's, he's saying, Tati, just tell me, who is this guy you just nodded to? And he says, oh, that man was my best friend, my best friend before the war. your best friend, his son says? He's your best friend. How come I never heard of him? Why didn't you stop to chat with him? He's your best friend. Why didn't you give him a hug? Why didn't you introduce me to him? Why didn't you show some warmth to him? Why did you just give this little tiny slight nod and you just walked away? And his father says, uh, I didn't think I should introduce you to him. And I didn't think I should stop and chat. And I really can't give him a hug and an embrace. Robbie was confused. Why not? And his father told him the story. In the early stages of World War II, Romania has tried to remain a neutral power, determined to stay out of the conflict that was beginning to consume all of Europe. But in 1940, the far-right Iron Guard overthrew the government, set up a new regime, and with a hateful fascist in power, the country was firmly in Germany's camp. By the next year, they would commit tens of thousands of troops towards the Nazi campaign against the Soviet Union in June 1941. Some Jews like Yechevet Brookstein's grandfather, were able to pick up on the smoke over the horizon. They began making plans to get out of Romania before it would be too late. With great difficulty, this man, her grandfather, is telling his son, he managed to secure papers and visas that would help his immediate family with his in-laws cross the border. At the time he was married with a young child, And he prepared for the worst. He got papers for himself, his wife, his child, of course, and his in-laws. Dreading the day he would ever have to use these papers, he hid them away in a hiding spot and he did not tell a soul. Except for one person. His best friend. That man. That man that I just saw, he was my best friend. They were both from Eden, religious Jews. They were Kavrusas. They studied together in Yeshiva. And one day we were discussing the war in Europe, Hitler's plans to murder every Jew. And he asked me, my friend, what are you going to do? So I told him about my plan. I told him about my visas. I told him about the hiding place. I shared with him what's going on as you share with a best friend. The next day, I went to take another look at my papers, and they were gone. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I turned the house upside down in search of the precious papers. Did I relocate them somewhere? Did I put them somewhere else? My mistake was I cleaning up. I looked everywhere, every drawer, every shelf, every bed, everywhere, every book, as they were nowhere to be found. I have not taken them out from my hiding place. I had a sick feeling in my stomach. I made my way over to the only person who had known about these papers that would guarantee my freedom, my salvation. I came to my best friend's house, and I felt my heart stop. His house was empty. My best friend had just left town and taken his family with him. Obviously, my best friend stole the visas 
and he got this entire family out of Hitler's Romania. Before I can even process the depth of betrayal, everything was gone. This man lost his entire family. His wife, his baby, himself, his in-laws were transported to Auschwitz where they were murdered. He alone survived the nightmare of Auschwitz. He came to America. Subsequently, he heard that his former best friend managed to avoid falling into the Nazi hands by fleeing to the safe side of Romania, remaining there for the duration of the war, he survived with his family and made it to the United States. His son, Robbie, standing there in Camp Chedra on visiting day in the Catskills on a hot summer day, was obviously astounded. He turns to his father. And he says, well, I don't understand you. This man was responsible for the death of your entire family. You lost your wife, your child, your in-laws. How could you even look at him? How could you even give him a cordial nod? How could you not punch him in the nose? How could you not kill him? And his father looked at him, and he told him these words. He said, I want you to understand. It was a different time. It was a different place. People were under tremendous pressure. Everybody was just seeking one thing. They were trying to survive. And when people are trying to survive and rescue themselves from death, they do unthinkable things. Now it's over. I survived, and I had to make a choice for my life. Will I begin living again, or will I remain forever stuck in infinite anger, resentment, frustration, hate, and animosity? I decided I want to create a new life for myself. You are my new life. Your children are my new life. I decided I have to let go. I just have to let go. No, I cannot be his best friend. No, I cannot hug him. No, I can't really look at him. No, I can't really speak to him. I can't do any of these things. Forgiveness in these situations is superhuman. But I had to make a choice. Will I live or will I die emotionally? Will I rebuild a future for myself or will I remain trapped and confined in this horrible animosity, anger, and injustice that I experienced on my own skin? And I decided I want to live. I want to create a future. And here I am today. The sixth Mida is Erech Apayim. What does it mean? The Rabbi Shalom gives time. He allows time. Maybe Erech Apayim. Maybe you'll still repent. What does that mean to us? How are we, how do we, um, how do we bring that into our life, Erech Apayim? Well, in the simplest way, maybe that person will one day, unlikely, say they're sorry. It's a possibility. But let me give you another possibility, how time makes a difference. And time does mute wounds or hurt. You know, something that in one cycle of your life could be very hurtful, if you're 20 and somebody says, boy, you have a big pimple on your face, or that other person is better looking than you, it could be devastating. Your hormones are raging. You're in Shaduchim. What's, how many times a day do you look in the mirror when you're 20? But you know, when you're 40, it doesn't really matter anymore if you had a pimple on your head. Nobody really cares. And you don't care most of all, for the most part. They say when a person is 20, they think everybody is talking about them. When they're 40, it doesn't bother them anymore. And they say when they're 60, they realize people were never talking about them all along. They're much more interested in their own lives. 
So different stages of our life, when we're a new parent, if somebody else has a new stroller, it could upset us. If somebody's kid is cuter, it could upset us. And later on in life, we don't really don't care about the fact the stroller or the kid is cuter. That's in a cycle, but it could be in day two. Somebody could say to me one thing on a day that I'm tired and stressed, that it's really upsetting. And a day that I'm feeling really rested and good about myself, it doesn't bother me at all. Erech you're really upset, give it a few days. Maybe in another day, maybe in another month. Maybe you'll look at it and say, what? That doesn't insult me at all. It doesn't even bother me. It's just it's a smile. So another reason to forgive is, give it a little time. Give that hurt a little bit of time. You know, I'll share with you a story. There was a, a famous kidney doctor who he did transplants. And it seems during one procedure, he insulted a nurse, and she was the head of the department, and she went running to the head of Cornell, and she said, the doctor insulted me. You know, today everybody's so politically correct. So the, the president of the hospital went running down to this doctor, and he says, I heard you insulted the nurse. You called her a, a blankety blank. Like, geez, what, what happened? Explain it to me. She so says, oh, I'll explain it to you. He says, you know, on Tuesday I do my transplants, so I like to go to sleep at 10 o'clock at night. So he said, I went to sleep at 10, and at 10.30 my beeper goes off, beep, 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 beep. I look at what is it the hospital's calling. He says, yes, you know the patient you did the transplant on a Thursday? Complications. They went into a high fever. Come to the hospital immediately. She says, I pushed on, I, I threw on my clothing, I ran to the hospital, I stabilized my patient. I got back home at 2.30 in the morning. He said, I had to be there 7 o'clock in the morning for surgery, so I set my alarm for 6.15. I was going to go with less than four hours sleep. So I, guess what? My alarm didn't go up, and just by, I woke up by myself. I look at my clock. It's 20 to 7. I have to be in the operating room in 20 minutes. I threw on my clothing. I ran into the kitchen. I turned on the hot water. I made a coffee with hot water from the sink with coffee. I ran down to the car. I'm, my, my clothing is flapping. I'm trying to button my shirt. I'm rushing to the hospital. The hospital is 15 minutes away. I'm two blocks away from the hospital. There's a red light. A lady gets out of the car in front of me and opens up her trunk. She forgot something. I'm honking. She makes an obscene gesture. I start screaming. She starts screaming back. I said, I'm rushing. She slows me down another three minutes. We get into this arguing match. Finally, I run to the hospital. But all the doctor's spots are taken. So I, I park by a hydrant. I run out. I run into the elevator. I come up to the fourth floor. And there's a sign. The operating room having an issue with the lighting. The operation is going to be on the sixth floor, where I usually don't operate. I run up to the sixth floor. Now, 10 after 7, everybody's waiting for me. I come in, and the head nurse of the sixth floor doesn't know who I am. So I run into the sixth floor. I'm wearing my gown. She doesn't know who I am. She looks at me. She says, what are you doing here? I looked at her. I said, what am I doing here? Do I look like the blankety-blank Starbucks delivery man? So uh, that's why I said that to her, she said. And I rushed into the operating room. So, sometimes you say things when you weren't supposed to, and when you, the other person, you know, when you look back and you look at it, you say, you know what, it was just the wrong timing, so maybe I shouldn't got insulted, or maybe she shouldn't have gotten insulted, so the next one is Erech let time do its work. Here's Rabbi Yaman Przanski. Earlier this summer... Came to shul one day on Erev Shabbos, carrying a sefer with me in the Siva Shalom. One of my favorite svarim on the Parsha. It was Parsha's Matas Masoy. And I, I was learning a shtickle over there, a little piece that talked about the different Masoys that Kalal Yisrael went on. 42 Masoys Kalal Yisrael went through in the Midbar over the course of 40 years. Came to shul, I was diving chakras, and after chakras, I was leaving the shul with the safe in my hand. And there was a fellow who saw me from afar. I knew him from somewhere. I didn't see him in a couple of years. And I said, Shalom Aleichem. And he said hello to me. 
young man, maybe in his low 30s, clean cut, yeshiva man. And he said to me, well, what's that safer you have over there? I said, oh, it's a uh, Nesiva Shalom. He says, oh, you know, I, I've always been thinking about learning that safer. I'd love to learn that safer. And we're schmoozing for a little while, and he says, you know, would, would you perhaps learn with me a little something on the parsha from Nesiva Shalom? I said, sure. I always love to share some Torah with someone. We sat down, and I went through this concept with him, the parsha about the different Masais. And the Siva Shalom of the explains that every person in their lifetime is going to go through various Masais. Why did Hashem write all these Masais in the Torah? It's to teach us this eternal lesson. The Torah is not just a, a history book. It's, a, it's, it's, it's relevant for today. And it's to teach us that each of us, in our own lifetimes, is going to go through 42 Masais. Different travelings. We'll have different jobs, different opportunities, meet different people. We grow in different stages. And in every stage of life, wherever we are, whoever we may meet, there's opportunity there to grow. And no matter what situation you're in, realize how you can grow, how you can become a greater person from your experiences. After I finish telling him this, we start talking a little, and he tells me, you know, oh, are, you, are you the writer? I said, yeah, I, I write stories, and I say stories. I try to give chizik to people. He says, oh, let me share with you something. And he tells me something fascinating. He tells me, you know, I wasn't always like this. You see, I grew up in Brooklyn. I went to the regular yeshivas. I went through the system, but the system never spoke to me. I just didn't get it. I had so many questions in yeshiva, and I didn't get how Yiddish guy really worked. For me, it was like Hashem was this person out to get me. Everything I did, if I did something wrong, then I'd get smacked from Hashem. And that's what my, re- my rebellion over the years taught me. Reward and punishment. And it was so black and white. And I, I couldn't relate to a God that punishes. It didn't make sense to me. A lot of things didn't make sense to me, he told me. And so I started to drift. And eventually I dropped out of yeshiva. And eventually I decided, you know what? I had enough of this type of life. And I rented for myself an apartment. I got a job, and I rented myself an apartment. On Friday night, instead of going to shul, I went to to Burger King. I went to hang out with friends, so-called friends. And I hung out with them, the worst of places. I was sinking so fast. I thought this was my chance to find a new type of life, to finally find some fun and satisfaction. Truth was, it was empty living. I felt so empty inside. Every night, when I came home, every, every, sat, every, every Friday, I'd come home after a hard week of work, and I'd just blow my money going to clubs and different places. It was a waste. I thought I was having fun, but it felt like just a, a worthless cycle where I would just make money just to spend it on nothingness. And yes, it was an empty life, but that's the life I was living. I grew my hair long. And I lived life the way I wanted to. I couldn't really connect to my parents. My parents tried to understand me, but they really couldn't. They didn't accept what I was doing, but they accepted me for who I was. They had patience. And life continued that way. One night, I was invited to a bar mitzvah in Lakewood. So I come to Lakewood to this bar mitzvah, a cousin of mine. And I walk in, obviously, I, I stood out. This was the yeshiva uh, bar mitzvah, and I had my long hair and my loud suit. And I came there, and they started playing the music, and I started to dance, and I loved to dance. And there I was dancing, and I was dancing with the bar mitzvah boy, and suddenly the bar mitzvah boy's rebbe grabs me by the hand, and he starts dancing with me. And he was dancing, and then he gave me a hug. And that was the end of the bar mitzvah. The next day, I would later find this out, that the rebbe went to yeshiva, and he said to the boys, you know, boys, I was at a bar mitzvah last night, and Yossi's cousin, He's off. He's off the derech. What can we do for him? We've got to help him. The boys say, Rebbe, Rebbe, how can we help him? He says, you know how you can help him? You could dive him for him. Let's say some tilim. And they start saying to him. I don't know what happened, but that week, a few days later, I suddenly had this urge to go to Eretz Yisrael. And I decided I'm going to Yeshiva Arsameach. I went. I got a haircut. 
and I went to Eretz Yisrael, I went to Eretz Yisrael, and that started my trip back to Yiddishkeit. I finally started getting answers to the questions I had. I, started, I finally started to relate to Hashem in a different way. That Hashem was a loving God. He was a God that cared about me, that loved me more than anything in the world. And once I discovered this new path, it started to talk to me, I started to relate to it, and I clung to it. So much so that eventually, I came back to Yiddishkeit. And he tells me that the Rebbe, when he heard that I went to Eretz Yisrael, he went ahead and he made a kiddush in the class and he celebrated with the boys. He says, boys, you see, your, your davening, your tefillahs work. We don't always see the end of the tefillahs, but tefillahs work. Anyway, this, this young man says, and I, it took me a couple of years, but finally I came back and I married a, a, a true Bas Yisrael. And today I live in Eretz Yisrael. I learn half a day and I work half a day. And I'm always looking to grow. And my kindleach, they go to yeshiva and they go to Beis Yaakov. And they say to Hillam, and I keep davening for all those boys like me who were so lost, who didn't understand who Hashem was, didn't realize that you always come back to your father because your father really loves you. And once you start to realize that, it's a different type of life. With the Yiddishkeit that my father taught me, I would never have been able to relate. But now that I fell, and now that I started to grow and realize and search for Hashem, I found Him. I walked away realizing how sometimes we have misconceptions. We think when we fall down, we think it's all over. But really, it's part of Hashem's plan. That part of the plan was we have to fall and we have to struggle sometimes. We have to go through difficulties in life in order to rise up again and become a new Bria, a Bria Hadasha. And that's what Tshuva is. Tshuva is recognizing that I, the person who I was, I'm a Bria Hadasha now. I'm someone new. I'm a new creation. Because my das change, my thoughts change. And when my thoughts change about who Hashem is and who I was, then I become someone new. I become a new person. I become a greater person. I become a person who appreciates every Nisayan and looks at it as a stepping stone of life, how far I could go. And so when we go into Yom Kippur realizing this, that those struggles that we went through is really what makes us great. We are zeicha to a true tshuva. And that will be the schuss that we need for a new, great gebench year. Thank you. The seventh midah is Rav Chesed, another important reason to forgive. The fourth midah is Rachum, forgive because you want to be loved. Rav Chesed is forgive because you want to nurture and love others. Do you know that most people will tell you that one of the greatest joys in life is giving. A parent loves to give to a child. People love to do for others. You know, when you ask somebody, what was some of the proudest moments of your life? They'll say, oh, I helped so and so out. I helped out this mice I helped out the bicket chaylam. I brought food to this one. I helped out this yasam. This kid was struggling. We need to nurture. People need to give. So if one isn't one of the greatest things we can give is we can give rachamim, we can give forgiveness. And additionally, if we never forgive and we don't have any more friends, who will we nurture? All, the whole fabric of society would crumble. There would be nobody left if we stood on Midas Hadin. So our need to give, it says, Rosh Ein HaOlam Eskayim. The Rabbi Kavi Yochel's need to give, Olam Chesed Yibana. Our Rav Chesed means our need to nurture says, look the other way. Because if you're so mad at your child, you won't have anybody to give to anymore. So let your need and your satisfaction and your love of nurturing override any anger. And that's a reason to forgive. The eighth Mita of Rachmim is MS. Truth. And what did a Chacham once say? To know all is to forgive all. If I could walk in the other person's shoes and understand their needs, their stresses, their anxieties, their insecurities, if I could understand where they're coming from, I wouldn't necessarily be hurt. That person that yelled at you, you know what they were really saying? They were really saying, 
I so desperately need attention. Why didn't everybody, anybody give me attention? Or maybe they're saying, why was I born with a pre, why was I born ugly? Why was I born with a predisposition to have an eating disorder? Why was I born with parents? who couldn't take care of me like the other. Why wasn't I born smart like somebody else? Why wasn't I born beautiful? Why wasn't I born into these? Why is my life so difficult? Why am I struggling so much more than you? If we could understand the MS of the other person, we would realize it wasn't really about us. It's more about them. You know, we say... Hashem Hashem kil rahal erech apayim v'rav chesed v'emes. So the rav goes on emes too. There's not one emes. There's many emeses. There's your truth. And there's often the other person has their own truth. I was on the board of yeshiva. And um, a child got thrown out one year. He broke into the principal's office. And he stole a few pushkas. And they found out that he went ahead and he bought some Game Boys with them. And they threw him out of the school. They said he stole for Game Boys. We didn't want him. A year later, another boy broke into the principal's office. He climbed through the ceiling, stole a bunch of money. And they threw him out too. And the Rebbe came to me. And the Rebbe said, you know, I'm very opposed. He said, why? He said, the first boy they threw out because he was Game Boys. The second boy... They threw out because his mother his peer, was a, a single mother. She was divorced. And they didn't have necessities in the house. And the kid was hungry. He wanted to buy food. He didn't. They just, he was on a skimpy. So he said he, he was starving. He was dying for some cake. For some, so he said, an extra roll, whatever it may have been. He said, I don't think the two cases are equivalent. I went to the principal. And the principal said, look, there's one MS. You throw a kid out for stealing. I don't care if it's for this reason, for the other reason. And I said to the principal, but is that true? Is, is one kid wants video games and one kid wants food? Is that MS? If you, if you have the same MS for both of them, that's not MS, that's Sheker. This kid has his MS and this kid had his MS. There's Rav MS. When we can understand the MS of the other person... It's so much easier to forgive if we could walk in their shoes. Let's hear a wonderful story from Dr. Pelkowitz about understanding the other person's MS and how it could make it easier to forgive. The story that illustrates this to me beautifully was I was seeing a man for a number of years who had a history that he reported of having been abused by his father, both physically and emotionally, especially throughout his adolescence. His father had a terrible temper. He would often hit him and hit him pretty severely and was also emotionally very harsh with him. And as an adult, he became successful. He married well and had wonderful children. But the major challenge of his life was the suffering he had at the hands of his father, and he constantly told me in our various meetings how he was consumed by, by anger at his father because of that history of abuse. One day he called me up to tell me that he was sitting Shiva that his, uh, to tell me about his father's patira. I assumed that that would be the end of his even needing to come. I thought that from that point on he'd be able to move on with his life. Instead, much to my surprise, but even more to his surprise, he became severely depressed. He actually became incapacitated. He was unable to go back to work. He was unable to get back to himself. And he was totally puzzled by the fact that he totally fell apart. But um, as we were going on with our sessions, One day he came in with the insight that he realized he wasn't mourning his father, but he was mourning the fantasy that one day in the future he would have the father that he never had. But as often happens in therapy, the insight alone wasn't enough. We were going on and on, and I was worried about him. And I shared with him some of the research in the field of positive psychology 
that shows that sometimes the pathway to forgiveness is to try to get into the head of the person who wronged you, is to try to bring a little bit of empathy to try to understand where they're coming from and to both share what it was that they did to wrong you, but then ultimately to get to a point of being able to try to see it through their eyes, to try to see that aspect of truth through the eyes of the person who wronged you. As we started to talk about that, he told me for the first time the story of his father's life. His father was robbed of his adolescence by Hitler. He was in the concentration camp during his adolescence. And as we started to discuss this, what became clear was that when he became an adolescent, it brought out all of his father's rage and anger and and understandable feelings of unresolved kind of trauma that came out on his son, whose adolescence reminded him of his own lost adolescence. One day, about one or two weeks after we had the sessions discussing this, he comes into my session and he is like a changed man. He looks lighter. He looks happier. He says, Doc, I don't think I have to come in anymore. I think I'm fine. He told me that earlier that week, he went to the cemetery. He had spent the whole week writing a letter to his father, throwing into the letter all of his anger, all of his resentment, but also all of his understanding and his renewed perspective and understanding where his father came from. And by looking at this truth, he was able to be Mochel, his father. He then took what had been a pretty long document And he told me he spent hours at the cemetery yelling and screaming and crying. He said, luckily, nobody was there. And he then took a big boulder, put it on top of the little book that he had written, on top of his father's Matseva. And he said when he walked away, he felt like a new person. I've kept up with him in the years since then. He no longer needed to come in on a regular basis. But it turned out that that was a permanent refua. Rafua that comes with the power of mechila, of forgiveness, that comes from being in touch with, with the, the core of MS. The core of MS, the ability to see things and understand things and empathize with, um, with, with, with the person who wronged you. Here's another story from Yosef Yitzchak Jacobson that illustrates this meter. There was a father with a bunch of children, and they were on the subway. And, you know, people are sitting in the subway and doing what people do on a long subway ride. Uh, Some people are reading the newspaper. Uh, Some people are dozing off. Uh, Some people have fallen asleep and they're dreaming. Some uh, Some people are just relaxing or reading a book, minding their own business. But these kids were quite wild and rowdy and they were driving everybody crazy. They they were running around. They were tripping over people. They were falling on people. And they were just making a big ruckus and a big commotion. And finally, one of the gentlemen on the subway could not tolerate the commotion anymore. And he turns to the father and he says, you know, as, as a parent, you should discipline your children. You should teach them how to behave. You should teach them how to be respectful citizens when they are with other, in the presence of other people. And the father looked at him and he said, you're right, and I really, really apologize for their behavior. I'm not even sure what to do. You see, we're coming back from the hospital. Their mother, their young mother has just died approximately an hour ago. And uh, we just left the, the hospital and we are on our way home. And I guess the children are trying to deal with it emotionally. And this is how they're expressing it. I'm not sure exactly what to do. And suddenly, everybody in that cabin, in that car, had a paradigm shift. You see, the facts didn't change. The kids were rowdy. The kids were making a commotion. They were waking up people. They were disturbing people. But from a sense of 
vindictiveness and anger and frustration and annoyance with this horrible father who, who can't discipline these crazy kids, it was transformed to a feeling of, of sensitivity, of empathy, and of compassion. The facts remain the same, but the perspective, the attitude, the hashkofa, the vantage point was transformed. Why? Because they learned some new facts they weren't aware of. They learned the background. They discovered the context. They saw what is behind the behavior. And everything changes. Everything changes. They now look at these children with so much sensitivity, with so much affection, with so much empathy. They're almost happy if the kids jump at the, and the, on them and they could somehow be an instrument in alleviating even a tiny bit of their agony and distress. How true this is in so many areas of life. We know so little about other people. We know so little about other people's experiences, their tor- turmoil, their agony, their distress, their inner and outer challenges that are visible and so much more that are invisible, conscious and unconscious. And part of of, of real growth, part of real spirituality, part of real dvekis in the Rebbeinu Shalayla is the humility, the sensitivity to be able to always be curious and inquisitive and to withhold judgment. The ninth meter is Neutze Chesed Lalafim. What does that mean? Rebbeinu Shalayla looks across many generations. He says, you, you're a Shababnik, taka the Teichsnish, the Stafoyle Jung. But I'm not going to get angry. You know why? Because I look at many generations. Your grandfather was wonderful. Your elder Zayda was wonderful. Your father was wonderful. Your children would be wonderful. Okay. You're just part, you're one of many generations. I'm going to look at you in perspective of a, a, a much broader picture, a much greater relationship I have with your entire family. You know, they, uh, they, they did a test once. They took a teacher, and she held up a huge white cardboard. It was three feet wide, and, in, and there was a black dot on it. And she asked an entire class, what do you see? And the whole class yelled out, a, a black dot. And she said, no, no, no. It's a huge white page, and there's a little black dot on it. And you know we we could do with a relationship? You could have a spouse who has cooked for you and, and made the bed and taking care of the children and she did or he did something wrong. And we take that speck and we inflate it and we demonize the entire person for that one speck. And you know what? And that's dishonest. Noitze chesed la means look at the entire relationship. That, that friend who didn't call you to wish you happy birthday? Did, didn't they call you when you were down? And didn't you chew their ear off when some date went very wrong? And didn't that boss who screamed at you, didn't they also advocate for your raise? And wasn't there another time when they looked away when you missed a few days because you had to be away? So look at it in the context of an entire relationship. You know, the New York Times hates President Trump. So what do they do? When he gives a speech, they'll take a thousand pictures of him talking. And of course, there's one picture when his mouth is open. He's saying, oh, you can't say an oh with your mouth closed. But when he says it, they'll, take, they'll snap, freeze frame that second, and it looks like a fish is about to swim into his mouth. And of course, they make him look absurd. Right? This is what, when you, you don't like somebody, that's what you do. Do we freeze frame somebody who really we, lo- we could love or has been kind to us or is- we have a relationship with, freeze frame one moment and say, this is what that person is? Or should we look at it in the context? Or what about all the good they do? So look at it more honestly in the concept of an entire relationship. And that's how we could be ma'ani, as'ata, in the mida of noitzer chesed la'alafim. <coughs> the tenth mida is noise avain. And what is Noisi Avain? Noisi Avain is the unforgivable. Do you know that 
Yiddishkeit, Judaism, unlike Christianity, believes there is a concept of the unforgivable. Simon Wiesenthal wrote a book about it where he spoke about himself. He says, when I was in the concentration camp, I was pulled out one night out of my barrack and I was brought to the bed of a Nazi who was dying. He had been injured in, I guess, was disease or injury, he didn't say. And I had no idea why he was, he says, I was terrified. And the guy said that he wants to talk to you. So I went over to the bedside and the Nazi looks at him and he says, I need you to forgive me. So he says, what do you mean you need me to forgive you? He said, I've killed so many Jews. And he related his story. He said, in this one particularly heinous incident where last year, he says, we took an entire village, we put them into the wooden shul in the village, we doused it with gasoline, and we lit it. And I heard the entire village scream as they were burned to death. He said, and now that I'm dying, I need a Jew to forgive me. So I asked them to pull one Jew in here and to forgive me so I could die in peace. So Wiesenthal writes, he says, and I just couldn't, I didn't know what to say. I was just silent, and finally they took me away. And after the war, he wrote a letter to 100 clerics, Jewish and non-Jews, should he forgive. And almost all the Christians say, forgiveness is paramount, of course. And all the Jewish rabbanim, for the most part, wrote back, they said, you can't forgive for two reasons. One is, what are you a Bailam? How could you forgive what he did to other people? It's not in your, it's not in your, uh, uh, it doesn't fall in, into your jurisdiction. That's Aleph. And they said, and additionally, he, they, they wrote, he, they wrote, they said, it's unforgivable such a sin. It's not somebody insulted you, they stole from you. It's the unforgivable. So what is Noise Avain? Somebody is pinned under a log. Some incredible pain, hurt molestation it could be. You can't forgive somebody who molests, rapes, molests. It does damage to incalculable. But you know what nice the oven is? I'm going to move past it even though I don't forgive you. There's no forgiveness here, but it will not define me. I will not allow what you did to me to define me. And that is the meat of nice the oven. The chato v'nake are two midas that I will skip. They're too kabbalistic and uh, in, in nature for me to really, I wasn't able to understand them. So I'm going to go to the last. We're going to do, out of the 13, we'll do 11. And the last one is v'nake. And what is v'nake? V'nake means it's cleansed. What does that mean? When we take the first 12 midas, and they become a reality so that they're so, we, we've worked on them and they've become so part of us. You know, it's when the Balchuva says, I'm a Balchuva for 30 years. Stop calling me a Balchuva. I learned in Kyle, I know more than you. I'm not a Balchuva anymore. I'm just like you. Or where the spouse says, stop reminding me. You said you forgave me, so why do you bring it up? It's the, it's the plastic surgeon that when he's finished the surgery and you look a year later, it's seamless. There's no scar anymore. It's where we've taken the Yud Gimel Midas Arachmim and made it part of our existence so that there's no more scar and there's no more pain. It's cleansed, the nake. What do we say? We say, Throw it into the ocean. You know, when you throw something into the ocean... It disappears. It's gone forever. I remember <clears throat> when I was in yeshiva, I went to the, the beach on Tel Aviv Friday. They had, you know, the, a lot of you, the yeshiva used to go. And I lost my glasses. And I remember saying, help me look my glasses. One guy said, you know, when your glasses fall in the ocean, there's nothing to look for. They're gone. It's the Mediterranean. What do we say about Yam? The Gemara in Bab Metziah says, if somebody's possessions get washed away in the water, it's called Zutai Shal Yam, so you could be screaming at the top of your lungs, I'm not Mayayish, you can't have it, whoever finds it, it's not yours. It doesn't matter, it's gone. It's irretrievable. Our pain at the end of the, the Mahalach of Forgiveness our anger, our scars, our, they should be gone if we really absorb these. It should be like Zutel Shoyam. There's nothing left. Total, absolute, court-induced Yish. 
total cleansing, when we have that, we talk a zeicher to a shana teiva, because all of the pains of yesterday are gone, and all that's in front of us is an open road, a sports car with a key, a drive, do what you do your next, your, your tachlas, your matara, your kabbalas for this year, because anything from last, yesteryear that could be holding you back, it's gone. It's zute shalyam. Now, a story that illustrates the nake, Rabbi Ber Leibowitz was a great Rosh Hashiva in Kamenitz, the author of the Ber Hashmol, and he had a, a daughter who got engaged. A few weeks before the wedding, the boy, when he was a brilliant boy, broke off the shidduch. It wasn't known why. Maybe he fell out of love with the girl. Maybe he found another girl, a better shidduch. And he broke the shidduch. And it was very embarrassing. Imagine by the word, Barabarach Ber, all the Rosh Hashivas came, the girl, her friends, etc. It was, you know, a broken shidduch can be very hurtful. And the boy, a few weeks later, got engaged to somebody else. And Rabbi Ber tried very hard, he said, to move on and to be Michael and to forget about it, just to move past it and try to, look, if the boy didn't like the girl, or whatever the case may be, you have to move on. Well, five years later, this boy was a brilliant boy, and he's invited to become the Rav, a possible Stella, in a, in a big town in Lutter. But beforehand, the Rosh Shakol, the head of the community, sees his resume, he learned in Kamenetz. He sends a letter to Rabbi Ber. What do you think of this boy? Is he really worthy of being the Rav of our city? And Rabbi Ber spent an hour concentrating and writing the letter. But before he sent it out, he called in two of the other Rosh Hashivas of Kamenetz, and he said, I want you to look at that letter and make sure that there's not even a gleam, a, 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 a shine, a sprinkle of any of the animosity that I had at him for the hurt he caused my family. Make sure that the letter is with all the appropriate accolades for this wonderful boy. And they approved it, and he signed it, and he sent it. That's when you can remove anger, um, distress, insult, hurt, injury, so much, it's the nake. When you can send an approbation letter for the person who hurt you, when you reach that level, you makayim the nake. And I want to, in closure, these yud gimel midas harachbim, they were a gift from the Rabbi Nishalem because it a, resilience is one of the most used words today in psychology. How do you get back up again after you've been knocked down? And there are books and books and books written about it. And certainly, the most resilient Uma, the most resilient people in the world are the Jewish people. Nothing has been able to knock us down. We are, to quote Mark Twain, in our ancient age, as spry and youthful as ever. And I believe that the secret to this resilience is the Yud Gimel Midas Arachmim, the way to move past hurts. So if we can take these Yud Gimel Midas Arachmim and actualize them in our lives, then we're for sure going to be muftach in a Shana Taiva and a Chsima Taiva, a good Kibenshtiar. 